Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Mormon Kabbalah Podcast. This week we're on verse 13 of chapter 33, and we're going to be talking about Hesed. We start off by reading this verse here. The fourth is Hesed, or mercy, to all the world the first day of creation. So as I've done with the previous Sephirot, I'm going to start off by talking about the Jewish Kabbalistic or traditional Kabbalah view of mercy, of hesed. Now hesed is a Hebrew word and it means kindness and it can refer to the love between people. But it's specifically used to describe the love that we have towards God and the love or mercy that God has towards us. In Jewish theology, the term is used to describe God's love for the children of Israel. And in Jewish thought, in in Jewish ethics, I guess I should say, it's used to describe the love or even charity between people. Because what's the difference between love and charity? Charity is an act of kindness. It is an act of love. And so therefore it is hesed. In Kabbalah, there is a term, teken olam, which refers to repairing the world. And it's through this mercy, hesed, that this restoration occurs. So from the Jewish Kabbalistic perspective, this is the emanation of God that represents his mercy. And as a Christian, this would be the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. According to a very famous Jewish rabbi, Simon the Just, he taught, quote, the world rests upon three things. The Torah, which I would translate to the instructions, service to God, and bestowing kindness. And he taught that hesed is the core principle that ties these three things together. And I would agree because the Torah is the teachings or the instructions of God. And what do they teach us? To serve the Lord and to be good to each other, to be kind to each other. So the Torah is mercy. It is kindness. It is hesed. That love that we have when we are in the service of God is hesed. And what does the Book of Mormon teach us? In King Benjamin's address, he says that Serving the Lord is serving our fellow man. There is no line. There is no difference between the two. And so therefore, by bestowing kindness, we are in harmony with the Torah and we are doing nothing more than serving our God. It's hard not to just get straight into the Mormon Kabbalistic idea here because really, when we're showing mercy to others, that's the light of Christ flowing through us. And that's the Mormon Kabbalistic perspective. From the traditional Kabbalistic thought, these are the emanations of God. But from the Mormon Kabbalistic thought, these are the emanations of God as they project out into the world through us. It is a core essence to our divine reality. And since this is the first day of creation, it's really hard not to make this about us. One Kabbalistic teacher, Moses ben Cordovero, he taught that the emanations or qualities of Hesed are to love God so completely that you would never forsake service to anyone, to provide children with all necessities so that they can survive, and to love that child. Now, being Jewish, that does include circumcision because that's a part of that's a ritual that is a part of their culture visiting and healing the sick that's not just jewish that's that's christian so is giving charity to the poor offering hospitality to strangers that's something that here in america we have been taught for decades is something we should not do because it's scary and that makes it wrong uh, taking care of those that have passed away, proper proper burial techniques, providing a bride the 
canopy that they stand under during the marriage ceremony. Again, this is another Jewish tradition. And making peace between one person and another person. Now, I would say that although there are two in here that are very core Jewish ideas, this list really can be very easily translated into Christian thought. In fact, most of it already is. We all are to love God. It's it's one of the first commandments in the Ten Commandments. Of course, we are going to raise our children in righteousness. Of course, we've been asked to visit and heal the sick. Of course, we've been asked to give charity to the poor and hospitality to strangers. Of course, we should have respect for and take care of those that have passed on, making sure that that they receive their honor and their due. Of course, honoring the marriage ceremonies and the marriage covenants and bringing peace into the world. And what's interesting here is that this is Mormon Kabbalah because this is things that we do. This is God, that emanation of God shining forth from us. And so it's very clear here that in traditional Kabbalah, this is the first sephirot of action. Now, from a Mormon Kabbalistic perspective, those before the first day of creation are actions also because we seek after wisdom and knowledge. We seek to gain that understanding of infinity that is Keter, the crown. At the same time, this is the first sephirot of action because it shows what we're going to do with it. And I think that that is why you have to have the first two sephirots before the day of creation and the first two that are the first and second days of creation together to unlock understanding, to unlock Bina. But I think it's pretty evident here that this is the Sephirot where things really start coming together and Mormon Kabbalah and traditional Kabbalah begin to overlap a bit. In Sefer Haba'er, it states What is the fourth utterance? What is the fourth emanation? The fourth is the righteousness of God, his mercies and kindness with the entire world. This is the right hand of God. As a Christian, it's hard not to see this as Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the mercy of God, the righteousness of God. He is the Torah lived, the Torah in action. His mercy, his sacrifice is a kindness given to the entire world. And so to me, it's very clear that Hesed is the sun. And this to me is a very interesting concept because this for Mormon Kabbalah is the feminine side of the tree of life. And yet it's where we find the sun. Does that make sense? I think it does. And the reason why is because Jesus Christ, that mercy of Christ is extended to all. And That means male and female, bond and free, so on and so forth. I think that the sun has to be on the feminine side of the tree because salvation isn't a masculine act, nor is it necessarily a feminine act. But it's an act that requires both the desire to bestow and the will to receive. As the sun is, He bestows the grace. He bestows the mercy. But being on the feminine side of the tree, he has the will to receive and the ability to take upon himself the sins of the world. And I think this really says a lot about the relationship between men and women. I know that there are people who like to make this stark contrast between men and women. Got to put them in their separate groups and you don't put them together. You don't, you don't let, I don't know, women play on a men's sports team and vice versa and whatnot. But at the end of the day, to God, we're all just his children. And so I think the Sephirot speaks to us on a number of different levels, with it being the first day of creation, creating male and female in the image of God, and this being the Son for Christians and Latter-day Saints, Mormon Kabbalah, that being Jesus Christ extending the mercy and accepting our sins. I think there's a lot that we can discover here, a lot we can learn here from the idea that 
This Sephirot represents a man, Jesus, the son, whereas the Sephirot above represents the mother, and this is the feminine side. So that's just something for you to think about as we're moving forward in this discussion. Now, getting back into the Book of Remembrance, I think everything that I just talked about ties in perfectly with the idea that this Sephirot, this emanation, is mercy to all the world. So instead, I want to talk about the second part of this verse, it being the first day of creation. So let's take a look at Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is verse 1. The earth is without form and void. Darkness is upon the face of the deep, or covering the abyss. The Spirit of God is moved upon the face of the waters. And God says, let there be light. And what happens? There is light. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, we've already talked about this in a previous podcast as it's mentioned in the Book of Remembrance. And I'm not going to go over that again because you can go back and listen to that podcast yourself. But I do want to look at that first day as it's recorded in First Moses from the plates of brass. So in chapter 3, starting in verse 6, the Lord tells Moses, And I said, Let there be creation, and thus my work began. And I saw the beginning of the creation, and she was good. And I divided the beginning from the end, and creation from creator, and light from darkness. And I called from a task to completion, or from beginning to end, an age or degree. The beginning of the day, and the end, night. And this I did by the word of my power, even the Elohim. And it was done as I spake. And the darkness of the evening was pierced by the light of the morning. And this age was the first degree. In Mormon Kabbalah, we talk about this idea of growing in grace as growing in degrees. And so this first day of creation is that idea of piercing the light from the darkness inside of ourselves. And so I think it's important to look at both of these in order to understand the Sephirot, because what is the mercy of God? It's that he sees us. It's that he's willing to divide the light from the darkness within us, the wheat from the shaft, in order for us to be perfected in him, in Jesus Christ. It's not this idea that we're just magically good all of a sudden. No. At the same time, it also isn't this idea that our wickedness is irrelevant anymore. Yes, the grace of Jesus Christ saves us from our sins. How? Why? The Lord brings a change to our hearts. We're born again, our hearts are pierced, and this mercy begins to flood out of us as the emanation of God. The light is separated from the darkness. This is the first day of our creation. And so because of this, we can see right from wrong. This is us partaking of the fruit of that tree and realizing that we're naked and we need to sow some fig leaves to make some clothes. This is us accepting the grace of Jesus Christ, and saying, Lord, I want to be more like you. That first degree is twofold. It is acceptance of the grace, the mercy of Jesus Christ. And it's a desire. It's a desire to be more like God because we were created in God's image. So we can study, we can learn, we can know. But now... Because we've accepted this mercy, we go and do. As always, the emanations of God have two parts. God shining these rays of his emanations upon us, this mercy upon us to transform us. 
And then, as James teaches, we show our faith by our works, not because it's something we have to do. We can't help it. We've accepted the mercy. We've grown in the grace. And so because of that, we go and do. Before, when we didn't understand God, we didn't know God. We didn't have a personal relationship with God. We were without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved over the face of the waters to gather up what is good inside of us. And gathering all that good up together, the Lord said, let there be light. And there was light. And we could see it penetrated the darkness. And so we saw that that light was good. And that, brothers and sisters, is the first day. Now, looking at this from the plates of brass perspective, the Lord sees us because we are his creation. And seeing us, the Lord says that we are good. And knowing the beginning from the end, and the creation from the Creator, and the light from the darkness, the Lord is able to separate these things. And that is the first degree. And how is it done? By the Word of His power. And who is the Word of God? Jesus Christ. And then it says, and even the Elohim. Who are the Elohim? If you go back up to verse 3, it says, in knowledge and in wisdom, Created I the Elohim, the heavens, and the earth. And I want to tell you, if you go back to Genesis, when it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, this is not an accurate translation. The proper translation would be, In the beginning, and technically it would be something created, a blank created, the Elohim and the heavens and the earth. What is it that created the Elohim? What is the Elohim? According to the plates of brass, the missing thing there that's, in, that's not in the Hebrew, that's not in the Hebrew Bible, is I, God created. I, not I as in me, the person making this podcast, but I as in the Lord. Yahweh, Vavhe, Yavah, Jehovah, Yahweh, so many different ways to pronounce those four letters. People think that he's not mentioned until chapter 2, but that's not true. His name was merely removed from the very first verse. It should read, In the beginning, Yavah created the Elohim and the heaven and the earth. And I will tell you that, Kabbalistically speaking, that's what the Kabbalists believe. That this blank something created the Elohim, and what is the Elohim according to traditional Jewish Kabbalah? It's these sephirot. It's these emanations. It's not literally other gods because they're monotheistic. But it's the sephirot. And I don't disagree with that idea. I think that if you are a Brighamite Mormon and you believe that the book of Abraham is true and the idea that gods came down and created this earth, I think that's perfectly fine. Believe that. I think at the exact same time, it's also true that God created in the beginning the Sephirot, these emanations. And these emanations are us because it says that we are created in the image of Elohim. What's the Elohim? The Sephirot. And so therefore, these emanations of God are also the emanations of us. But when are we created as the emanations? Is it at our birth? Maybe. But I'll tell you what, until we're born again, until this first day, they're not going to be visible. Because this first step, this first degree, is the first step in us becoming who we truly are. I know that as Latter-day Saints, we like to talk about the restoration as this thing that Joseph Smith did. But I want to look at it differently. And I want to look at it as something that Christ is eternally doing. I don't believe that the restoration is about going back to Acts 2 and trying to figure out how the church is supposed to look or be formed or be organized or work. I think that that is a Protestant idea and it's not a bad one. I'm not saying it's wrong. 
I'm saying that when the Lord talks about the idea of the restoration, of the restoration of all things, I don't think he's talking about going back to the Bible and trying to recreate old things. I think he's talking about the restoration of us, restoring us to our true selves, who we always have been and who we always will be. That is the true restoration. If we look at the first three sephirot, we have the infinite reality of God, Keter at the top. And then we have knowledge and wisdom, or wisdom and knowledge. All three from before the foundation of the world. Then we're born. A veil covers us and we forget where we came with. We forget our infinite nature. We forget our infinite wisdom and our infinite knowledge so that we can have this finite experience for whatever purpose. But once we're born again, that's the first day of creation and we begin that journey back, that restoration back as Jesus Christ asks us to walk in his grace, as we have accepted his mercy, as we go back to where we were, to who we were from before the foundation of the world. And the first step in this restoration is the first step that Joseph Smith had when he went into the sacred grove, seeking God dividing the light from the darkness, accepting the mercy of Jesus Christ, humbling ourselves before the Lord and saying, I don't know, but I want to. And what is it that we want to know? We want to know God. It doesn't matter what your question is. It doesn't matter that Joseph Smith went to the grove to try to figure out which church he was supposed to join. What he was really discovering was the reality of God. It's the same thing with us. You get down on your knees to pray to see, if, to know if the Book of Mormon is true. What are you really doing? You're asking, God, are you real? Are you out there? And will you talk to me? This guy Moroni is promising me that you will. Will you? And to millions of people, millions and millions, I should say, because the Book of Mormon has been around for, what, nearly 200 years now? The Lord has said, yes, I'm here. I'm real. I'm listening and I'm speaking to you in a special way that you and I can understand. And brothers and sisters, that is hesed. That is mercy. Verse 14, in my mercy is mankind washed clean. Mercy is the charity of Yavah. Thus is the right hand of the Father. That goes right back to everything I've already said. The light being divided from the darkness, washing us clean. The charity of the Lord being the right hand of the Father. Jesus being the right hand of the Father. And it really goes back to that list that Rabbi Cordovero put together. This is everyone's ministry. If you're a seeker, you seek God and you seek to light the world with that light of Christ that we've been given. If you're a disciple, you learn from the Lord and then you share what you've learned with those around you. And if you're a minister, you go out and do and you help the seeker and you help the disciple and you help bridge the gap between people, whether it's between the Lord and people or people and other people. This is what we've been called to do as Christians, as Latter-day Saints. This is the restoration of all things, bridging these gaps. And that makes us the right hands of Jesus Christ, even as Jesus is the right hand to God. And we know he's the right hand because this Sephirot is literally on the tree symbolizing the right hand. Now, let's wrap this up by looking at the herald. In verse 15, we read that Tzadokil is the herald, and Tzadokil walked the earth as John, who was known as the Baptist, until he died from the lust of another. So who is Zadokiel? He's more commonly known as Zadokiel without the T, or Hastiel with an H instead of a Z. And he is not in the traditional scriptures, the Bible or Book of Mormon, but he is an archangel known in Jewish and Christian theology, mythology. 
Some believe that Zedekiel is actually the unnamed angel of the Lord who comes to Abraham in Genesis to stop him from sacrificing his son Isaac. And so if you see him in artwork, a lot of times he'll be holding a dagger to represent that story. Some people believe that this is another name for the archangel Michael. But what's important here is that the name means God is my righteousness. And as you know, what I'm doing here in this podcast when it gets to the angels is looking at the name. What does the name mean and what does it tell us about ourselves and about this Sephiroth? So the fact that this is the angel of mercy and it means God is my righteousness, that that really ties into the whole idea of the Sephiroth of mercy and the right hand of God or this Sephiroth, this emanation representing the Son of God. Because really, what is God's righteousness? It's his mercy. And of course, John the Baptist is a very, very famous prophet from the New Testament. John is an English version, based on the Greek, of course, of the Hebrew name Jonathan, or Jonathan. So really, it's just a shortened version of Jonathan. And it means Yavah has been gracious. So I think it's interesting here that we have these two different ideas. God is my righteousness and God is gracious. And we have this angel that represents mercy. And what did John the Baptist do? He baptized people, washing them clean, showing them the mercy of God. So you can really see how these fit together with each other and with this Sephiroth. If you put these together, this basically says, God is gracious, God is righteous. And so, if we are going to let the light of Christ shine through us, if that emanation is going to represent us as the creation of God, then we must be righteous. And that's what the scriptures teach, that we are to be righteous, a righteous people, because the Lord is righteous. And so, again, this is a reflection of ourselves. We are made clean because of the gracious God that we worship, that we belong to. And so our righteousness belongs to the Lord because our God is righteousness. So I think this really ties things together very well. Now, to be clear, at the very end here, it says, until he died from the lust of another, when John the Baptist was imprisoned at a birthday party for Herod, Herodias's daughter performs a dance that made him very happy. We'll just say it like that. That's, that's how the Bible describes it in the Gospel of Matthew. So he makes a vow with her that he'll give her anything she wants. And her mother encourages her to say, I want the head of John the Baptist on a tray. So while the king regrets what he had said, he made a vow in front of his guests. And so he kind of put himself in a bind and he was forced to behead John. So this is true. He did die from the lust of another. And Jesus actually comments that John the Baptist is the greatest of all prophets born of women. So what do we take away from this Sephiroth? I think it's pretty simple. God is mercy. And so therefore, as Christians, if we take upon ourselves the name of Jesus Christ, and we don't take upon ourselves the name of God in vain, as we're commanded not to do in the Ten Commandments, then we must be merciful also. And when you read in the scriptures, what is it that people get condemned for the most? Not being kind. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed simply because they had no mercy. They wouldn't help the poor. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He says, love God, and the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And as I always like to say, I I don't know that there's a difference between the two. How can you love our creator? How can you love God and hate his creation? It doesn't make sense. And as King Benjamin says, be merciful upon the poor, 
because we asked for and accepted the mercy of God. How can we not show mercy to others when the Lord has shown his infinite mercy to us? So brothers and sisters, this is the mercy side of the feminine side. We have this we have this masculine sephirot over here on the feminine side because the sun represents men and women and Jesus needed to be able to accept our sins and give us his grace. He had to have male and female to give and take. And so I hope that we too can can find that part of us that is created in the image of God so that we too can give and take in mercy. Now, before I let you go, I do want to ask if you are watching this on YouTube, please like this video. If you have not subscribed to the channel yet, please do so. Share the video with your friends. If you are listening to this on a podcast app, make sure that you are signed up for the podcast so you can get the latest updates. And until next time, shalom and God bless.